Meenadi, you have called yourself a chronicler and recorder of the women's movement and a grandmother of women's studies in South Asia. Your generation has also been called the daughters of independence. As daughters of independence, did you inherit a women's movement? Well, in terms of sheer members of a particular generation, uh, and along with all the rest, I did shout that slogan, Sri Swadhinata Zindabad. You could see that. That uh, uh, we grew up with this kind of a feeling about uh, being free in free India and uh, uh, be treated at par with men. Beyond that, I have to confess that uh, I wasn't aware of much of the issues beyond the uh, those experienced by middle class. But you look, women in the, uh, my part of the country. So there was no real consciousness of the women's issue as such. And that's why the, uh, the whole exercise of the Committee on the Status of Women in India came as such a terrible shock. Such a terrible shock. It's that terrible shame and outrage that we claimed ourselves to be highly educated, professional women and social scientists at that, and we knew nothing about the lives of the overwhelming majority of women in this country, both the lives that they had inherited and the lives that they were facing in contemporary India. This. Uh, was the real foundation for what I have described as the collective consciousness during the committee's exercise. You know, that it's, it hit us all, the, the, particularly the four who went on to become members of the drafting committee. In general, what would you say was happening with women after independence? Like because uh, leaders like uh, Kamala Devi and all were still there, you know, they were part of the freedom movement, they were still there. So what it would say in general was happening to Well, them? all this, some of this I heard much, much later. After the uh, committee's report, when I went to request Kamala Devi Chattavarthi, whether she would, she would record her memories of the pre-independence period. After thinking, she did agree, and that's the inception of Indian women's battle for freedom. Uh, but uh, she told me one or two things which uh, uh, substantiated uh, my personal experience of having sort of fallen out of the struggle altogether, you know. She said that when Punjab Assembly uh, tried to change the inheritance laws, the, 
she went round Delhi to the women's organizations to mobilize some protest so that people would go to Chandigarh and demonstrate there. And she met with such lukewarm response that she was completely disheartened. She said, they You tell me that uh, you had no consciousness. Well, I had some experience of that. I, uh, I couldn't get enough support or to fill one bus to go to Chandigarh and protest. There were quite a few other uh, instances which we found out during the uh, committee exercise. Uh, the the most uh, 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 classical example of a positive opposition to women's equality. Uh, of course, uh, Chaudhary Charan Singh, when he was Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh, writing to the Home Secretary that uh, why do you keep sending, uh, recruiting women into the services? They're a headache. So the Home Secretary very apologetically wrote back that, uh, that it was not something that he could prevent and drew his, uh, the Chief Minister's attention to Article 16 of the Constitution. The, Next letter from the Chief Minister said, well, they, at least in that case, don't send any of them to Uttar Pradesh. Sucheta Kripalani, when she was Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh, had invited from Kerala a Gandhian, the lady Mrs. Karkut, I think, and to build this women's component within the community development program, and she had built it on classical Gandhian lines, you see, literacy, not including knowledge of the constitutional new rights, uh, uh, economic activities, and maternity and child health. The, that entire program was smashed by Charan Singh and uh, Mrs. Karkut was driven out. Vinati, when the committee was set up, what was its mandate? We have to re review. What we need is a review of the extent to which the constitutional uh, provisions relating to women have been uh, achieved. So this is, begins with to examine the constitutional, legal and administrative provisions that have a bearing on the social status of women, their education and employment. To assess the impact of these provisions during the period since independence, then on educational, specific references to educational development, problems of working women, including discrimination in employment and remuneration. Status of women as housewives and mothers in the changing social patterns. And, and case to, to undertake case studies on implication of the population policies and family planning programs on the status of women. You'll find the significant omission in this is the word political is completely missing. So the kind of political uh, awareness of the whole issue of women's status that had developed during the freedom struggle or that could be found in the writings of this man was completely absent. I mean, he went on saying that uh, Not only must women not suffer from any legal disabilities that men do not suffer from, they must have complete political equality. 
They must have the work, but the problem does not end there. It only begins when women begin to women. Later in trying to explain this paragraph, I, I say what he meant to say, women as women. This is the collective consciousness. That's what he had in mind. Vinadi, when you were appointed uh, as member of the committee, um, how did you think you would uh, work on the report, uh, considering what the mandate was? I can say that in the first year of my membership, I was a very indifferent and disinterested member. And I also missed a few meetings. And nothing much was actually going on. One meeting we went to, we were informed by uh, the member secretary that we had to meet the minister in the afternoon with an outline of the report. So I was wondering what sort of an outline, because none of us really had a clue what was the state of progress. Very few tours had been done, and what kind of information was being gathered, we just didn't know. I just put down a few chapter headings. And it was easy. We had set up several task forces. So I, according to the various task forces, one chapter each. And uh, in that, I added one chapter on the demographic perspective. And my colleagues asked me, why had I introduced this? It was not within the terms of reference. So if I had the terms of reference before me as I did today, I could have drawn attention to that last term about population policies. But at that point, my only explanation was that my colleague in the UGC, Shankar Narayan, had given me a report on the status of women in Japan. It said you were part of that committee, you might like to have a look at this. And I found in that a chapter on demographic changes. So I thought, you know, it would be a useful uh, thing to have. But none of us had a clue as to what were the demographic changes. So I said, well, that's an exercise we can do still. The, uh, there is no uh, uh, difficulty because we are excellent demographers in the country. So the, with that one sheet of chapter out in headings, we went to the, meet the minister. Then there was a message from the Planning Commission. Okay, the, there was a transition taking place. A new plan was about to be drafted. So if the committee had any suggestions, they decided that uh, it, 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 it would be good courtesy since a committee like this was already in session for more than a year and a half. So again, a hasty exercise with people saying something, etc. So at that stage, um, putting together whatever suggestions were worth anything coming from different members, I had to do the drafting job because uh, our member secretary just couldn't do it. And then she disappeared from the country. And two years were about to expire. So everybody expected that the committee would seek an extension. At that stage, we, some of us got together and told Fulranuti, we can't go on like this. So, uh, and we refused to be party to wasting public funds in this manner. So we would choose, prefer to resign. So she said, yeah, I will, so I also will join you. 
So eight of us went and met the minister with our resignation letter. At which stage he said, "Don't, please don't publicize this. Uh, give me a little time." So within, literally within ten days, he had got the committee reconstituted. And the only real change was that the member secretary was dropped and I was put in as member secretary. Uh, Viradi, you had uh, one year to prepare a very important report. Uh, can you tell us uh, how you went about the process of collecting the material and uh, initiating the whole process of uh, drafting this report? Uh, well, a few things had been initiated earlier because Polyanudi sent me to um, participate in the political task force that had been set up before I joined as a member of the committee. I attended one meeting and I went and told Polyanudi, you will get nothing from this group because uh, the, uh, I was very rude. I said, Pulranudi, these are w women with political aspirations. They want to get into politics, but they can't define what is politics, and they haven't a clue where information is available. So she said, uh, what, uh, what, how do we go about it? I said, well, this is a hell of a lot of work that has been done on uh, Indian politics, particularly since independence. There are academics galore who have studied every election since independence. So if we call in their help, at least available research-based information can be gathered. So she said, you go now, go now and talk to Naiksa. When I went to Naik Sahib, Naik Sahib said, all right, what do you want? I said, I need a working group. I need people like Iqbal to put together what is available. And I, 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 want, I can't do it because I have my work in the commission to <laughs> cope with. In that working group, I just uh, pleaded with people like Iqbal saying that, please, please undertake this exercise. Because they were the survey researchers, they were the ones who had been studying elections. So Iqbal said, all right, I'll go and talk it over with Naik Sahib, I will identify people. But once I became member secretary, Lotika Di, Leela Dube, and myself, plus Kumut Sharma. Between the four of us, we drew up a long list of additional, additional research to be done, some of which will be, will, have, will require uh, even field level studies. And all in a very short time. That's the way I wrote the political chapters, you know. I, spent three nights, three nights reading the potha which Iqbal had sent and that Sirsikar had sent. And then in one day, 14 hours non-stop dictation, the chapter got read. Uh, what was the nature of material that was coming in from the field? And uh, the women who were in, involved in drafting this report, uh, what was their perspective towards the material that was coming in? You see, the material, uh, the information, there were variations in different states. But the uh, marked difference that we had noticed in Himachal Pradesh between what the middle class women 
were posing and what the uh, peasant women were saying, there, there was this marked difference. One tremendous challenge, I must tell you, that uh, there was this Kisan woman in a village who just stood up and said, go and ask the government of Himachal. Who runs the Himachal economy? The men or we? Because the majority of the men go off to the plains in search of jobs or they go to the join the army or the police. We do the way. It is a orchard economy or uh, uh, agriculture. We do all the work. But because of this taboo on our taking up the plough, we have to find, find, search desperately for hired labour just to engage. And sometimes when it becomes difficult, we do operate the plough, but we lose space in the village. So here was something. When uh, we went to the northeast, Arunachal, Nagaland, Manipur, from the educated urban women. All right, they were working in various offices, clerks, typists, a few doctors, a few teachers. We couldn't get a word out, only giggles. But the, the next morning when we went to the village, The entire village people were lined up in a circle, men as well as women. And they had put a few chairs for the committee members and the Home Secretary, who was accompanying us, also acting as interpreter. And there was this one woman who came and stood before us. They write all the... Every. And she came up with these absolute challenges about the threats women faced from the presence of the army. And uh, the Home Secretary was feeling terrible. You know, he was trying to stop her, but she went on. She went on and uh, there was one young woman standing just next to me. She found the Home Secretary's translation was wrong. So she sh shouted up in English, that's not what she said, why are you distorting? So I called her, I said, you translate. She was the primary school teacher. And she translated and she said, this is what? she's been saying. No, we were taking notes. That evening, the three of us, Lotigadi, Urmila and myself, we had a real discussion. And Lotigadi said, can you tell me what this development is all about? So Urmila promptly said, this is something we have to, this question has to be posed in the committee. I mean in our report. So then this is how the questions were coming off the soil. And much earlier, again it was Urmila, who had, in, during one of the discussions of the committee, uh, persuaded the, uh, us to adopt what uh, I have described as a self-denying ordinance, that we are not going to look at feminist literature from the West, 
because uh, ours is a fact-finding exercise and we are going to draw the issues from the soil. So nobody read anything uh, coming from the West. This self-denying ordinance, as far as I am concerned, still remains. Because I don't think uh, the, I, I am a supporter of the International Women's Movement and we have participated in the, uh, all the debates in the international level. But the, the kind of, uh, you know, imposition of paradigms from the West that we had to fight on the whole development debate, the same kind of imposition uh, is going on today, and that has to be fought. Vinadi, you have written um, in one of the articles that uh, all of you had to work literally round the clock to prepare this report because the time was very short. And uh, in the Towards Equality report, there is also a note of dissent. So within the short time of writing the report, you have also had time to do this note of dissent. So can you tell us about that? Well, the, the issue, as you know, is over this uh, reservation. Lotika Sarkar and myself, like other members of our generation, had always ad adopted our position that we want equality and we want non-discrimination. We do not want special protection, we do not want reservation. That had been our position. And uh, the... but this what was coming of the soil, first from political activists, young women political activists, middle-aged women from different political parties, they said that uh, whenever work has to be done, we are called. But when tickets are to be distributed, you have to be someone's daughter or someone's wife or someone's mistress. And uh, there was a distinct feeling of resentment amongst the activists, which did not look good for the future. The second was the united position taken by my political science friends who had undertaken these studies. All of them, all of them wrote. And when they sent in their reports, in their introductions they said clearly that political equality had not brought about real equality, because in the political deliberations of the nation, women's proportion was falling. All these groups combined to recommend very strongly that the Constitution does provide special protection for women, if necessary, and we think reservation should be considered. In the committee, however, there was a very remarkable mm, cleavage. Lalit Sen, who was a rural sociologist, and he had done enormous amount of work on panchayats, uh, rural politics, social transition, the community development program. 
He came and said categorically, he said, uh, when it comes to what the constitution says about women and about children, there is just no awareness in rural society that women have been assured any rights under the constitution is just not there. So something has to be done, right there. So in the committee agreed to make a recommendation about the, the introduction of women's panchayats, a sort of a conversion of the Mahila Mandal uh, into a, a, a different sort of constitutionally, uh, legally protected body as the spokespeople for women's interests. That recommendation they accepted. When it came to the state assemblies and parliament, flat refusal, flat refusal of any reservation. No? We've always opposed reservation, we will. So, at that stage, Lotikadi said, but your position is inconsistent. I, too, have always opposed reservation for women, but I am faced with the ground-level evidence. So I shall be compelled to give a note of dissent, and I said the same thing, both of us. So that dissent note finally got written only on the very last day. So on 31st December, Lotikadi walked into my room and said, when are you going to draft that dissent note? She, after this we will so she closed the door. She said, I brought your stenographer, now dictate. So the uh, dissent note was written like that. We are still plagued by that. But uh, my, my position has also changed. I don't really give a damn whether the reservation bill goes through or not. But I, my advice to the women's organization is don't allow any tampering with the bill as it stands. Vinati, what was the impact of the report on all of you and on the nation in general, those who received the report, how did they react to it? Well, as far as we ourselves were concerned, uh, I think the three of us, uh, Lotika, the formula myself, we were shattered, shattered and uh, with the definite impact on our self-images that uh, how on earth we had remained completely insensitive to all these issues. Because all of us in the drafting committee, we had to face the issue that our educational system itself had been a great contributor to this, what I called intellectual parda behind which the lives of the majority of women had been pushed. But uh, the most major impact was that uh, what were we going to do with ourselves? This questioning. And uh, I pushed it to the back of my mind 
now there is no time, I've got to finish the report. But towards equality, I am increasingly discovering did not really reach all that many. Where it did go was, uh, it, did, it got sent to the UN. And uh, certain copies had been taken to the Mexico conference and people who managed to pick it up, they, they went and bombarded the embassies asking for more copies of this report. It, within the country, it is the summary which a lot of people read, including... Uh, now I think Mrinal Gore, Pramila Dandavate, uh, Ahilya Rangnekar. The three of them were in jail during the emergency and they told me later uh, um, uh, that uh, we spent the 19 months in jail wading through this Mahabharata. And uh, they came, came absolutely charged. But the first question, Mrinal and uh, Ahilya both were in parliament, the 77 election, and uh, they said, we are going to assemble all the women members of parliament, but you and Lotika have to come and explain certain things which nobody understands. For, and the first question is this declining sex ratio. What does it mean? What is it? In the academic world, it percolated slowly, and uh, but within a few years, the, the kind of proposals that the ICSSR Committee on Women's Studies began to receive were an indication that it was making an impact. The international impact, uh, Lotika, the and I realized in 1976, a year later, both of us had been invited to uh, first international conference on women and development being organized by a group of uh, what you might call area studies scholars, feminist scholars, but they, they were specialists in particular regions they had worked there in Wellesley, Wellesley College near Boston. We landed up to find that uh, everybody, a whole lot of people there had read the report and they were full of questions. Whereas uh, women from other third world countries who had things to say which were very similar to what we had found. They hadn't had access to that report. So that's where the Third World Alliances were forged and uh, then to, we took the first chance to take the issue before the non-aligned. That basic integrity, do you think it has come from this Gandhian background? I think so. You yeah. think so? Absolutely. Veenadi, you have uh, talked about the emergence of a collective conscience, but before that you must have undertaken an individual journey, kind of a personal voyage which would have been there before that. So can you tell us about your growing years in Kolkata and the early influences in your life? Well, uh, since you are a fellow student of history, uh, you picked up the, the 
right symbols. I suppose it does feel like a journey, but I can't say that I was conscious at that time. It's later, recollecting, that uh, I sorted out the early influences, what made a lot of impression. And uh, the pure love of history helped. Uh, I was born into a middle-class Bengali family. I was born in Calcutta in 1927. The, but the, the family was very used to being a migrant household because my father worked on the nursing and harnessing of rivers. And uh, so he was all the time being shun moved from one place to another. So my mother had spent 11 years in the South, picked up a fair amount of Telugu, Tamil and Kannada. And I suppose she had, by the standards of those days, she had a much more varied exposure. She was certainly the strongest influence on my uh, growing up period. Vinati, you mentioned your father. What kind of a person was he? My father uh, was again a mixture. Uh, he was a scientist. He became a civil engineer, determined to learn how to reduce the ravages of floods. So, and at the same time, I'll, he thought of himself as a very traditional uh, Indian of that generation. What made me tremendously proud and uh, left a very deep impression, was uh, his decision to take premature retirement uh, in 1942, when he received orders to collaborate with the army uh, in mining all the dams and embankments in East Bengal, uh, uh, which he had helped to build. So he went straight from that meeting to his office, wrote out an application seeking premature retirement in, with immediate effect. 1942 was an um, important year really? and uh, in your family, with the decision your father had taken, um, what were you in 1942? Were you in school or had you completed school? I had just finished school and appeared for my, uh, what was called matriculation in those days. One of my cousins was uh, going to Ashtosh College to uh, take part in some student protests. And uh, so I went along with her. And that was the first induction into taking part in student politics. Uh, after that, uh, the other steps came very easily, uh, getting elected as the pre uh, secretary of the students' union of the girls' section of the college. And the late 40s, uh, uh, most of us uh, were out taking part in some demonstration or another. 
there's something or other going on all the time, some days, you know. Uh, the INA trials started and uh, Calcutta University colleges poured, students poured out completely. So this, uh, the, and uh, finding an opportunity to take uh, the uh, students from my college to go and have a look at the Mahatma who came in the middle of all this. Uh, he was staying just outside Calcutta. A uh, lot of excitement. But the one interesting memory which surfaced much, much later, and when I checked it with other student activists, whether my memory was uh, strong enough or whether they had, you see, there were three common slogans Azad Hindustan ki jai, Chhatra Ekata Zindabad. Stri Swadhinata Zindabad. Inadi, can you tell us something about your Oxford experience? Sure. Uh, the first, first major experience was uh, a jump in confidence and uh, Losing the fear of the unfamiliar because uh, I had never been away from the family, and uh, because I was the youngest in the family, everybody, all the brothers, sisters, parents, there was a there was a kind of a protective attitude, and. Uh, uh, outside the immediate family, the, this big extended family again there. I was the, I was a kid, kid cousin, you see. But uh, finding myself waiting for a train to Oxford in Paddington, I felt so paralyzed with fear. And I just didn't know what I was going to do. That I, I, in this whole country there isn't a soul I know. But, uh, and it was educationally, it was a very rewarding experience. Very rewarding experience. The three years went by quite quickly. And uh, I came back. I came back just after the Constitution had been adopted and India had become a republic. Vinati, you said that when you came back the Constitution was already adopted. Uh, so when, uh, in 1947, when India attained independence, were you in Delhi then? Oh yes, from 46 onwards, uh, Ma and I, had gone to Delhi to join my father. And uh, that's where I sat for all those entrance exams to Oxford and all that. As a result, uh, we escaped the great Calcutta killing of 46, but uh, managed to be very much present at the midnight session of uh, Parliament transfer of power and heard Jawaharlal's great speech. Prior to that, I did sit in the visitors' gallery for quite a few days uh, at listening to the Constituent Assembly debates. And uh, so full of the sort of euph euphoria, I, I have very vivid memories of uh, 15th of August. My father woke me up early morning and said, come for a walk. Don't you want to see that Union Jack coming down and the tricolor going up? So we went to walk to India Gate and saw the flag being changed. 
And then these masses of people outside the parliament uh, building after the morning session on the 15th. 14th night had been the midnight session and 15th morning was the formal uh, session. And uh, I sat on the bonnet of our car watching the sea of humanity. A lot of excitement. What happened after you returned from uh, Oxford? You said you wanted to teach. Uh, I first talked to my mother. And uh, she said, go and talk to your father. So with a lot of trepidation, I went and asked him, I want to apply for a teaching job. So he looked at me. He said, uh, well, that was understood. So I looked rather blank. So he laughed. He said, look, when I agreed to your going to Oxford, I knew this day would come. So I was prepared. But in the meantime, something else has happened. The country has adopted a new constitution which tells me I cannot discriminate between you and your brothers. And since I've always told them that my job ends with providing them with some education, and after that their life's decisions must be theirs own. So the same applies to you. Go ahead and apply, and I'm very happy you want to teach, rather than go, into the, sit, go and sit for the competitive exam, which my brothers were pressing me to do. So I started applying and uh, I did get an offer from Baroda University. Uh, my father was a bit unhappy. He said, it is so far away. But I was not quite well, so I just for one month's joining time. Suddenly in the middle of that month, quite unexpectedly, the Patna University they had invited me for the interview. I had not gone because it was very hot. I was not well. And people told me nobody was going to give you a job in Bihar. You are a Bengali, you are a woman, and you are young. So on three counts, nahi milega. But anyway, I did get to Patna. The vice chancellor had a final meeting with me. and. Uh, the job was offered. So I joined uh, the middle of 1951 and I quit that university only in 1965 when I came to uh, came to the University Grants Commission. Vinadi, I think the years between uh, 1951 and the time when you were uh, appointed member of the Committee for Status on Women in India are very important years in your life mm. because uh, those are years when you make a lot of moves from one place to another. And that is also the time when you got married and you set up a family and other things. So uh, can you tell us something about your joining Patna University to teach because at that time you still want to teach? Yes. No, I certainly wanted to teach and I suppose I was looking for uh, an independent life. And uh, the, the changes that took place in the 50s, it's, you know, they sort of came one on top of the other. They were all very rapid. And uh, they made deep changes in my life. But that does not mean the teaching faded into the background. I enjoyed. The first great change, of course, uh, apart from my marriage and uh, the arrival of the first two daughters was the departure in rapid succession. Between 56 and 59, I lost my father. 
I lost my mother-in-law, who loved me enormously, and uh, then I, my mother. So, when I try to think back to the 50s, it is the, it's the, the f feeling of being bereft. You know, we, we left uh, to fend for myself. And uh, that's why I think uh, the opportunity to go back to Oxford for a hard stint of work, more because I felt uh, that uh, if I was staying in this profession, I have to do some solid work. And, uh, but I was compelled to take the kids along with me because uh, the two mothers had departed. Meenagi, when did you return from uh, Oxford? 62. I was out for exactly two years and I came back uh, to find uh, my department. The, all the, the old seniors who had been so friendly, so uh, beneficent, let me say. They had all gone and uh, the atmosphere of the new department was very different to what it had been earlier. Also the, the last pair of kids also arrived. So, but by that time the first two had grown up a bit, so they, they shared. They shared a great deal of the rearing responsibilities along with their father. The Education Commission had just started functioning in 64. And uh, that was when I was real, realizing that I must get out of Patna University. I couldn't continue. So this, it seemed to be a good idea that this is the time when it would be a good thing to go there. They have, whatever comes out of this commission, there will be measures for reform. I wanted a hand in it. And uh, it uh, coincided with Shankar's plan. He wanted a little more time to uh, devote to his training. So I sent up an application. So that way the UGC under D.S. Kothari proved to be a, even, I would say that even more powerful learning experience than Oxford had been. I was finding out for the first time what India was all about, much more than I had known. So challenging, hard, uh, exciting, but very hard work, very strenuous. I lost 40 pounds in uh, three years after joining the UGC without any volition on my part. So an offer of a two-year fellowship from the Simla Institute to work on education and social change was very welcome. But before I had been in Simla more than two months, comes an offer of a chair from a university of Barampur in Orissa, appointed in absentia so that's, I still couldn't make up my mind. I came down to Delhi. So finally I landed up with D.S. Kotari. I said, sir, I don't have a father left. In all such situations, ultimately it was my father who helped me to make up my mind. So I've come to you. He said, now, now you have really put me into difficult situation. 
So uh, I can't advise you as the chairman, UGC. I have to advise as your father substitute. I think you should give the new university a trial. Before two years were out, the same D.S. Kotari says, if you want to come back, come back now, because I have a senior post, which you, which you should have had a long time earlier, but now I have a vacancy there, so now you come. So I couldn't, again, what to do, how to make up my mind, and no father figures there. So that's when I went to that astrologer. Uh, you must tell us about that. <laughs> Minadi, you must uh, tell us about uh, going to the astrologer and what happened afterwards. Well, he just helped me to make up my mind, you see, because uh, I was not getting help from any other source. By telling me that if you don't go, things will go badly for your children. Although there was no question of... So straight to the telegraph office from his house and uh, I sent up a message to the secretary UGC that I will be jo joining on the 2nd of May. But just before leaving Parampur, this letter from the education ministry came saying that uh, you have been appointed to this committee on the status of women in India. Now, when I came back to Delhi and rejoined UGC, I didn't even remember about this committee or the sending of uh, acceptance. But uh, in less than a year and a half from my return, I suddenly found myself member secretary of the Committee on the Status of Women in India, something to which, till just six months earlier, I had not attached any importance. Vinadi, um, you spoke um, very beautifully about how your uh, personal life got uh, more and more linked with the work you were doing. Earlier you had spoken about this collective consciousness that all of you developed at the end of the Towards Equality project or during the process of it. Now, what happened after that? What was the follow-up after the Towards Equality report that you wrote, which you say radically altered your life? I needed a break, so I went to visit my brother at Shantiniketan. I took leave for one month. And while there, the emergency was declared, and I received a prompt summons from Nayak Sab So, it was Nayak Sab who really thought up the follow-up, not me. He was looking absolutely bleak, he would remember how fair he was. But he literally looking down. After a few seconds, he resumed and said, uh, they've changed the nature of the polity. I don't know whether we can ever get back. And then suddenly, as if he had drawn yeah. new uh, inspiration from somewhere, he looked up and said, well, let us focus on women. Go and write a policy paper for a research program focusing on poor women. I don't think the powers that be will understand the political significance, at least not just as yet, because I don't think we will be permitted to do much else. So get down, get down, now write a policy paper. 
why such a program, what should, should it investigate it. So Kumo then I put our heads together, worked on this, consulted Lotikadi at some stage, consulted Professor Mitra. And that was the inception of the ICSSR's program of women's studies. Absolutely on the backdrop of the emergency, it was a direct outcome. Is so this how the CWDS was set up after this, the CWDS? No, 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 no. CWDS does not come into existence until 1980, my dear. I'm oh. still talking about 1975, oh. the declaration of emergency. Mm -hmm. Through the emergency, we concentrated in trying to get studies done on the five areas that we had identified. It was only in 79 that the committee, the advisory committee in charge adopted a resolution which went to the ICSSR recommending the setting up of an autonomous institution the, uh, to carry on the seminal work that this program has initiated. The resolution uh, was drafted jointly by Ashok Mitra and uh, Justice Krishnaya. It went to the government and one of the things that Mrs. Gandhi had done during the emergency was to constitute a national committee to do justice to women, which never met through the 19 months of the emergency. The Janata government came, that committee was reconstituted. It met only once and did nothing. But, but Raj Krishna in the Planning Commission was trying to help. So the Ministry of Social Welfare was negotiating with other ministries to get some support. Again, 1980 election comes. Well, you know what happened in the 1980 elections? So a small group, Naiksan, Ashok Mitra, Lutiga, Sarkar, myself, we met. What happens now? Naiksab said, So we now draw up a constitution. We we'll take a copy of the Registration of Societies Act and there is a model provided so you can sort of fill in all the material. I will be coming two weeks later and I'll help you to finalize that. So Ashok, we will meet in two weeks' time, we now will have the draft constitution ready because we have to take formalize that decision. And then we register. I say, nice, sir. Ek paisa ka provision nahi hai. Aap kate ho, ho register. And he looked at me, he said, good work that needs to be done never gets held up for lack of resources, only lack of determination. So I said, all right, a mantra. Don't let, I, I mean, it took some time to absorb. So by April 1980, the registration was through and uh, Max Hub had organized a grant from the Vikram Sarabhai Foundation. So you know who was responsible. 
the same person was already working on the Ford Foundation, yeah. Kamla. And uh, told me, don't worry, don't worry. Uh, it will take a little time, but the foundation is quite, quite committed to supporting your venture. The other hope of support was from the ILO, Rural Employment Policies Branch. So that, those were the sort of assurances. But uh, Naiksa, uh, as soon as this Saravai Foundation's message was there, he said, now you can afford to go and go and hire a building. So I hired a building and we started off. It took nearly the full year for the Ford grant or the ILO grant to be cleared by the Bharat Sarkar. Now, Nirmala Bhuj, as the representative of the government of India, was a member of the ICSSR Committee on Women's Studies. So she had been a party to that resolution recommending the setting up of an autonomous institution. In 19, towards the, uh, the uh, she, she was just returning from Copenhagen, the mid decade conference. And uh, she came and said, all the exercises that we did for three solid years, everything is being chucked, declared as junk. What do we do now? How do we save these ideas? How do we ensure that some of it gets into, because the Janata plan was then sort of thrown into the junk heap. A new planning commission under the chairmanship of N.S. Swaminathan had come into existence. So what is... Now by that time, you see, I had learnt a few, few things from Naksa. So I said, my dear, this is where you, the bureaucrat, and Vina, the academic, bows out. We, because this is not something you want noise. So you need a mobilization. This is where we turn to the National Women's Organization, who picked up, picked up the dowry issue picked up the dowry violence issue, who picked up the Mathura case issue. These are the people who can mobilize public opinion. So the two of us called up the national women's organizations, six of them, and they were kind enough to include the CWDSS as, as a sister organization. And the, uh, this group met in the office of the YWCA of India, because IV Khan took a lot of interest. There was a seminar using all those documents which had been put together in the Planning Commission or in the uh, Agriculture Ministry. And the outcome of that seminar, the summoned we, uh, Dr. Swaminathan, to the afternoon session. So Swaminathan came. The press was very well represented. And the, it was a sight. Aruna Asaf Ali standing with her white hair flying. Swaminathan, how dare you? 
how dare you reject all these ideas? They are being recommended by official committees constituted by the government of India. How dare you throw them into the waste paper basket? We will not have it. The, it's, it was a fantastic sight. That's the inception of the Seven Sisters. Vinadi, can you tell us something about uh, how the Indian Association of Women's Studies was formed and uh, why it was uh, necessary at that time to form this uh, association? In 1980, sometime in 1980, just after the CWDS came into existence, Hemlata Swaroop had become the new vice chancellor of Kanpur University. Once she became vice chancellor, she wanted to do something within the Kanpur University. So she came to Delhi and she talked to me. And I said, "All right, invite Radhika, invite a few others, Mrs. Butch also," and we met. In that meeting, Naik Sahib said, now we need, you need a national association. If you want to promote women's studies uh, within the country, you need a national association. But the best way of going about that is to convene a national conference first on women's studies. I'm sure Nirmala, the Bharat Sarkar will provide some assistance. He said, we'll have a national committee to convene this conference. And the best person to be chair of that convening committee is Madhurisha, Vice Chancellor SNDT Women's University, which is the only institution today which has a research centers focusing on these issues. So it's well. And out of this national conference, you get a mandate to form an association. That's the democratic approach. That's the way we pushed up. And uh, we knew that we could tap UNICEF, we knew we could tap uh, um, Ford Foundation, some support will be available. So this was decided. So the conference was convened, and out of that came the resolution forming the association. In 85, several of us were invited to a binational seminar on women's studies uh, in the United States. You remember the, what, what was it, Festival of India that year. And uh, we met at Sarah Lawrence College and uh, many of my friends that I had made over the 70s and the early 80s in uh, with the women's studies world in the United States were there. In that seminar, we were told by the principal of Sarah Lawrence College. She said, you know, you people were much brighter than my colleagues. So you took a stand that women's studies is not a discipline. She knew the entire story. You decided that uh, it was a perspective which needed to be incorporated in all other social science disciplines. She said, uh, yours was that kind of legitimacy that you were able to organize. I wish we had thought of that earlier. 
Vinati, this uh, recording will be incomplete if I don't uh, ask you about the Bankura project in West Bengal that CWTS has taken up. Uh, it's very close to your heart and you have written a lot about it and you have spoken a lot about it. So can you tell us just a little bit about it? Well, this is the ILO project, which I mentioned earlier. And uh, soon after the center came into existence, I went to West Bengal to talk to the only civil servant there whom I knew, that was Devabrita Mandapathya, who had gone back to West Bengal uh, as Land Reforms Commissioner and was organizing this uh, Operation Barga camps. Mandapathya had noticed a tremendous increase in the number of women and children on these periodic treks. And they all looked half starved. And uh, the children looked even worse. Babies in arms. And when he had asked questions of, uh, from the district level officers, the only answers he replied, and uh, he got in reply, was that, uh, uh, yes, there is an increase, uh, possibly because they want to go to Hooghly and Badwan, where they can also shop and where they can see some cinema. It's not there in Makura. They have no access to such things. So it was against that backdrop he had decided to hold this camp. During the three days of that camp, uh, I was able to inform Bhajat uh, Mitra and Mandapathai that uh, there is an old woman in their group who was sitting and sort of going on talking to herself in Santali. And I managed to get one of the other women who spoke Bangla more fluently, that, can you tell me what she is saying? And this old woman had linked up the whole cause of their decline in their situation with deforestation. The forest gave us food, fodder, fuel, as well as a livelihood. When they cut down the forests, they took away all these things. And so we had to go on these perpetual treks just to save the children. And those whom we try to save, we lose half of them in the process of these treks. So this kind of information began to surface in their internal discussions before the camp even started. And uh, so it, that itself became another learning process. And before the camp ended, Binay Choudhury, the land reforms minister who was there right through listening. He called me and he said, uh, Ashok Mitra tells me that you are coming to West Bengal to take up some kind of a project on rural women and you are looking for a location. This is where you start. You have just seen what condition these women are in. To make a beginning with this. So we began as assist, you know, to assist them. And it ended up as a partnership and it's a mutual learning, mutual empowerment process. That's why I have regarded 
that project always as my battery recharger. When I feel too jaded and uh, sort of creeping, creeping hopelessness and powerlessness, I used to rush up there. It is still on. It has expanded. They have demonstrated their capacities. They have become some kind of a power in that region. And for the last uh, seven years, uh, I have been, with their help, I have been promoting uh, similar groups in the neighboring district, Medinipur. It's been a very, very rewarding experience, which uh, I have certainly described as a mutual empowerment process. It's not just the CWDS helping the women to empower themselves, but in the process, this partnership has helped many in the CWDS to empower themselves. And first of all, me. <laughs> Viladi, we have come a long way from the Towards Equality Report. And uh, a lot, many things have happened since then. What do you think of the women's movement in India at this point of time? I would say that, like many other efforts uh, from the people's side, the movement has taken some beating through the 90s, but its grassroots base has in fact expanded from the same 90s. The, sa the same causes have produced both the effects, some fragmentation of organizations, some jargonization, the impact of globalized terminology entering women's studies. But the same process is strengthening the expansion of the grassroots space. While I wouldn't dare to predict for the 21st century, because I am basically a 20th century person. I can only hope that, in the same way that I hope that the people of India will with all these challenges and rise to the occasion. I have the same kind of hope from the women of India. You people have to carry on. <laughs>